New Lines Magazine, this is The Lead. I'm Erin Claire Brown. Last week, millions of French school children returned to their classrooms to start a new year of learning. But as families were in the midst of back to school shopping, one item of clothing was swept up in controversy when France's education minister, Gabriel Attal, made an announcement that the abaya, a long, loose robe often worn by women across the Middle East, was no longer permitted in schools. The ban has its legal foundation in a law passed in 2004, which forbids the wearing of conspicuous religious symbols, like crucifixes, kippahs, and hijabs, in schools. French officials say this is a critical part of maintaining laïcité, or secularism, in public institutions, and helps students stay focused on the task of learning. But critics of the ban say that the abaya is not a religious symbol, and point out that the order gave no parameters for what exactly constitutes an abaya. This ban is just one in a long line of controversies over what religious women, and particularly Muslim women, wear in France. We wanted to understand the issue and interrogate whether culture and religion have melded, whether they have a place in public institutions, and how France is thinking about the future uh, education of its population. To do that, today I'm joined by the French legal scholar Rimsara Alwan and my colleague Rasha Alakidi. Rimsara, Rasha, welcome. Let's start with the basic outlines of what's happened in France. Rim, could you talk us through a bit of the history of banning religious symbols in schools in the country? Thank you so much for having me. It's really a, um, a pleasure to talk uh, to you guys and on um, this extremely difficult topic. So it's a long story. <laughs> So I have to go back in time, if I may, so that your audience, our audience can understand what's going on in here, because I hear a lot of things. I read a lot of things on social media that are not always accurate. So I would try to be as accurate as possible to give you like the the element to understand our situation. So as you probably know, France is what we call a like country. Okay. So that's uh, the name we give it, is a form of secularism. So I won't translate secularism with laicity because all secular countries are not necessarily laic. The doctrine is kind of simple somehow. The idea is that the state shall not interfere with religious affairs and vice versa, right? Because of the history, we have the Catholic Church. And I would say, since I, I guess we also have an American audience, as far as I'm concerned, some people would disagree. There are two countries that actually are like country and separate, in theory at least. The United States and France. But there is a difference. The, in the US, we, you have the First Amendment, correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, the idea is to protect the people against the abuses of the state. So you protect people's belief, religions, whatever, against abuses of the state because of your history. In France, it's the other way around. We protect the state against the potential abuses from churches, so from religions. And when it comes to laicity, historically speaking, the French idea of laicity has its origins in the education system and was connected to to our way to approach the treatment of religion. It was at school first in the 19th century, I mean, in, yes, in the 19th century, that we had the first great lake laws on, on public schools, where the idea was to, re, to, schools was considered, and it's still until today, the place where we create the future citizens. So we needed to protect pupils, basically, from any influence, and especially the influence of the Catholic Church. So I give you, like, History 101 here and straight to the point. And so the idea was not to make sure that the kids become atheists. Not at all. The idea was that the church would stop having a say in anything related to school. So, for, for instance, religious class, religion classes catechism, for example, was replaced with civic education, right? And all the programs were, quote-unquote, secularized. Fast forward five, uh, a law was adopted called the Law of 1905 on Separation of Church and State, which established the uh, idea that 
the state shall not interfere with religious religions and vice versa, but also that freedom of religion and freedom of conscience, and that's very important, so the right to believe, to not believe, or to change religion, was officially recognized. And as a con- what does that mean? It means that religious neutrality will be central in implementing such a thing, meaning that the state and the people representing it, so meaning civil servants especially, had to be neutral. So to ensure that equality between citizens were guaranteed. So yes, civil servant, when they're you know, on their duty, when doing the duty, shall not show any signs of religion or philosophical or political beliefs. However, religious neutrality did not apply to the individuals. Individuals were free to express their religiosity as long as, and that's the limit, public order does not, is not disturbed. And so for Francis Standard, it was quite liberal. There was a liberal vision of laicite that has been applied for years, at least in mainland France, because it didn't apply to colonies. And I'm thinking about Algeria, but that's another story, I guess. Until the 90s, where we have witnessed a transformation, and that transformation started in public schools. So I wanted to hop in and, and ask about this because you're you talk about how initially there was this allergy, you know, towards outward expression of faith, primarily coming from the Catholic Church, right? When French was a young republic, they were trying to extract themselves from the influence of the Catholic Church. And, you know, I mean, I think early in the 1900s, they banned the wearing of the cassock, the, the cassock, the, the long black robe that many Catholic priests wear. So when you said in the 1990s, something changed. And I'm wondering, is that when the focus started to shift towards Muslim symbols? And, and was that tied up in other anxieties or, or social and political concerns? It's a very good question because, of course, it's like the, the political crisis, if I may say, started in the 90s. But I was mentioning Algeria. And actually, so first of all, in general, in France, we have a profound of like hatred and uh, suspicions towards religion as a whole. We have a past uh, that is not exactly a glorious past when it comes to uh, religious freedom. I mean, uh, if you look at the history of the Protestants and, of course, anti-Semitism that until today is extremely, uh, I mean, it still exists. It's outrageous, despicable. Uh, But we have a history that is extremely damning when it comes to religious freedom. But in general, there is a suspicion towards religion. And that's what I was saying. Like, our vision of laicity is really to protect the state against religion, really, or its abuses, if I may say. But Islam, precisely, uh, when you look at history, has always been perceived as a religion that was at odds with, you know, with Republican principles and friends. So, Fun fact, in Algeria, during colonial Algeria, when France colonized that area, there was separation of church and state did not apply to Muslims. Even though some Muslims actually asked the French government to apply laicity to them, because that would mean equality with others, other people, which was denied. So what, the, the what did that look like? I mean, so when you say that, that that separation of church and state didn't apply in in colonial Algeria to Muslims, what did that look like? And it, how did that manifest itself? So basically, to make it very simple, and I apologize if it's oversimplified because it clearly is, Sharia law was kept for Muslim population. So even though they asked, you know, to have laicity apply to them. But the problem is applying the same law to everyone would mean being equal. And that's not something the French want because they control, you know, the native population of Algeria, the Muslims naming them. And, uh, you know, there was a time it was the Jews before. I mean, if you hear about the Dreyfus affair, that also is also part of our history. And I, I forgot to mention it, but actually separation of church and state does not apply on certain of our territories in France. Until today, if you take Alsace-Moselle, it's the Concorda, a Napoleonian Concorda, where three religions are recognized and taxpayer money pays for the clergy. So naming Catholicism, Protestantism, and Judaism because of history, and especially history with Germany. 
There are some overseas territories as well where separation of church and state does not really apply with the decree Mandela and where the Catholic Church is recognized. So even though it's, co it's considered like the cornerstone of the Republic, the principle without whom the Republic would fall apart, I'm like, yes, but there are territories until today that still do not apply it. So it has been transferred, it has been weaponized. And uh, when it comes to Islam, to come back to, you know, the, the question, Muslims have always been perceived as a threat, including garments like the hijab, for example, that in Algeria at that time, the, the, the veil was considered a symbol of resistance. I don't know if you heard, have you guys heard about the unveiling ceremony? No, tell us a little bit about that. So during colonial Algeria, the... There was military propaganda, of course, and especially when, you know, demands for independence started, where they took Muslim women wearing headscarves on the public square, and the idea was to unveil them, to welcome them to the Republic. And you would have a bunch of white Europeans and, and French, because, you know, they also brought the French for to get more, so that colonization would be more efficient. They would unveil her and applaud and be like, you are welcome to the Republic. There are propaganda posters that I can show you eventually that say, aren't you so pretty? Unveil yourself. And you have like a woman with a headscarf, like a hayek, which is like this big coat worn traditionally in Algiers, especially, but across the country, where you veiled, and then slowly you see a woman removing, depicted removing her headscarf, and like, unveil yourself, aren't, aren't you so pretty? So Muslim bodies, and especially female bodies, have always been weaponized and used as an instrument. And this hatred towards Islam, this suspicion has been going on after decolonization and especially after the first wave of immigration post-colonization of many Muslims from North Africa who came to work in France. And that's how things started to change. Thank you so much for that, Rim. That was I've never heard of these incidents before. And I think it really does help shed some light on the context when we go back to history. So, Reeb, your work focuses in part on religious liberty. And as you've alluded to this before, you mentioned it, that France does have freedom of conscience and it's enshrined in its constitution. But why does laicite take such precedent over a freedom of religion in the state? And you also hinted at why, at why this is the case when we go back to history. But this suspicion of religion and and why it's it's absolutely a priority, like laicite is more of a priority than freedom of religion in France. Can you go down to like the core reasoning of that? Where does this come from? I would say that the problem is not laicite itself, because in France, laicite is supposed to guarantee freedom of religion and freedom of conscience. The problem is what we have done with it and how we have instrumentalized it, how we have weaponized it into a tool for political identity. And the same way some use religion for political identity reasons, uh, we are doing the same way with religion. If anything, I would say we are not applying laicity as it was thought in 1905 at all. Contemporary, the, there is an expression for that in law, we call it the new laicity, has illiberal dimensions as it is increasingly understood as an antonym of religious freedom and as a, a ground for restriction to religious freedom. And more and more, we impose religious neutrality to individuals. And the problem, like in the last few decades, laicite has been used to kind of entertain this sphere of the quote-unquote Islamization of Europe. And as you probably know, we have experienced many horrific attacks, terrorist attacks from groups that claim to be Muslims, so from extremists. And this has been used as a reason to restrict religious visibility, especially targeted as Muslims. And, and France is home to, to the largest Muslim population, at least in Western Europe. And it has been, if you want, the epicenter of this, of this movement. 
And, you know, if you go back to the 90s, and if you take the international context, and Russia, you are far more competent than me to talk about it, but the 90s have witnessed a lot of geopolitical events. The civil war in Algeria started, many events in the Middle East as well, that clearly put light, a, a sad, horrific spotlight on Muslim populations that have been assimilated to, you know, extremist, terrorists, you name it. And from now on, we never stopped. Mm, that's so interesting. You know, I actually, Rasha, I wanted to to jump in and, and ask you a little bit about your own experience and, and your and your background. You know, I think one of the things that makes this new ban in France unique and, and kind of perplexing is that the abaya is not actually a religious symbol. You know, it, the, the hijab is, is, you know, as a veil, it's it's worn as part of, you know, certain Muslim women's expression of their faith. But the abaya is more of a cultural or even sort of a regional symbol, if you can even call like a piece of dress a symbol. You know, it's something that's worn all across the Middle East. And I know that you grew up in Iraq, in, in Nineveh, right? Or in Mosul as well, sort of the two. But I know that Nineveh is is home to one of the oldest Christian communities on earth. And I'm curious, was the Abaya something that only Muslim women in your hometown wore? Or was it, you know, more of a geographical <laughs> sign than anything? Uh so the abaya, it's so interesting how the abaya is worn throughout all of Iraq. But if we're sticking just to Ninoa, like, for example, my, my late grandmother, when she would, which, who, who was Muslim, when she would wear it, it would just cover like the top of her head. And now I'm talking about the long black garment that was opened um, from the front. And she would kind of like put it on her shoulders and then under her arms. So you can see exactly what she's wearing under it. So it was just like kind of just something she would put on her shoulders. And it was a symbol of her saying, I am a grandmother. I'm more of a, I'm over 56 years old. That was her way of saying it. And this was not just the Muslim community in, in Ninoa. So if we go to the, the ancient historic Christian villages of Bartolla, Al-Qosh, Karakosh, Telkef, um, Bakhteda, they, the women, particularly over the age of 50, it was kind of just a, a, a symbol of grace as they are aging gracefully, let's say. And they would also place an abaya on their heads. And most of the garment underneath was like th thobes or gowns that were, let's say, half sleeve. So you can see their arms, but the abaya would still be on top of it. And it they took this, perhaps it was inspired by Muslim culture but or by the Mus what Muslims used to wear, but it ended up being sort of a symbol of, like, like I said, of aging gracefully. So it, had, it ended up having nothing to do with Islam. There, in the local markets, when you would see women of this age, it would be impossible sometimes to tell their religion even. And this is where, we well, just alluded to this, this is where the, con the, you know, the irony kind of, of how interesting this is. So you can see a Muslim woman and a Christian woman both wearing abayas, and you would be unable to tell their religion. So if anything, it helps kind of confuse religion instead of revealing what the faith is of a person, which is the exact opposite of what France is describing the Abaya. Yeah, it's, and I find that very interesting. It's so fascinating. You know, I, so I live in, and work in Tunis and in Tunisia, one of the traditional pieces of dress for women here is called a safsari. It's, it's half the length of what a traditional sari would be. So I think it's three meters of fabric instead of six. And it can be white, it can be striped, and it's often just kind of a, a woman will drape it over her head and pull it over her shoulders. But it's not, it's, it's not strictly a, a Muslim piece of garb. In fact, you know, a, a friend of mine who's an artist here who's Jewish, who was born on the island of Jerba, which is home to one of the oldest Jewish communities in North Africa, you know, he just made this gorgeous piece of artwork about his grandmother's safari, right? You know, she, here's here's a woman who's been part of a, a three thousand year old Jewish community who's wearing the exact same thing that her Muslim neighbor is wearing, and and I think I think it really speaks to that that there's this idea that you know what we think of as culture has has started to melt a little bit with with religion. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, the Jewish community in Iraq, when they were still around in the, the 20s, 30s and 40s, they also the women there for the same reasoning also used to wear abayas. So it was more of a this was particularly in Baghdad and in the south, south southern Iraq. So it's it had very little to do with any Muslim identity and it had different cultural symbolism to it. So, Reem, if you if you agree with this and we we, mm -hmm. we all agree that 
abaya is kind of yeah. more cultural. It's not actually religious. I mean, I was thinking about what other cultural symbols can France possibly ban? I was thinking initially, was it like, I thought about beards, if, or is that going to be considered cultural? What about the henna? And henna is very popular and it's considered kind of, especially now, it's very trendy. But when you look at someone with a woman's, particularly with henna on her hands and all the delicate art related to that and the designs, you think of Middle Eastern, you can think a little bit of Africa, you think a bit of Asia. Is that going to also be considered like a religious symbol? What about our fancy, fabulous slippers that we call babouge <laughs> that is very very middle eastern is that oh, also yeah. going to be considered i mean i, I think if france if, would france come out with a ban saying babouges are now <laughs> you, you cannot wear a babouge to school i think we would laugh at it but it does kind of seem that that could possibly be a realistic outcome what do you think oh i i keep being sarcastic about it but don't joke we have cases actually about the beard uh, especially Muslim men, yeah, where, so it was not at school, by memory, it was, by memory, is correct, it was, he was a civil servant wearing a beard. He happened to be a Muslim, but he was accused of violating religious uh, neutrality. But uh, the point is, is what, we have a concept called us, uh, and we open a Pandora box, because of course, what is conspicuous? Nobody is able to define it. People say big crosses, big Star of David, hijabs, obviously, but still anything can be religious if you make it into religion, right? Abayas being uh, one of them. So we have a, an expression in law that is called religious garment or symbols by destination. <laughs> Meaning, for instance, we had cases of long skirts bought at like H.A.M. or Assos or choose your favorite uh, retailer, worn by Muslim students in, uh, in public schools who happened to wear a headscarf, but they would remove it at school, you know, they would just wear a boring long black skirt who was deemed proselytizing. So what, what is a religious garment or symbol by destination is it is a garment, a piece of clothes, whatever, which should not be religious. I mean, like a bandana or a skirt, but we are going to look at the intent of the wearer, the intention of the wearer. And how, how would they know that? How would they know that? My theory is like, you cannot perform such a thing without racial profiling. Quite, I mean, in my opinion, I mean, because if you take a, a white non-Muslim girl and a, a black or North African or person of North African background or someone of sub-Saharan, you know, background with a name that make you think that there might be Muslims, maybe yes, maybe not, automatically, like for you, the intent would be, you know, to be to to be proselyting like uh, your religion so we are going to look at the intention of the wearer and in the case of it, the abaya what happened is like i said separation of church and state the state shall not interfere with religious affairs this is like basic okay and in that case the government said that it was a religious attire even though everybody says it's not including one of the main Muslim religious authorities in the country that say abayas are not, there are Muslim majority countries who don't wear it, who have other type of cultural garments, right? And despite that, you know, they deemed it religious and now anything is considered an abaya. So I've read recently a lawyer tweeting actually that he has clients, especially one kid who was kicked out of school because she was wearing like baggy pants and like a pretty, yeah, baggy top, you know, because she has like, I mean, according to what was reported by this lawyer, okay, so I'm just reporting here, because she has like weight issues, you know, teenagers, and I mean, you know, like. She was trying to slim down a little she bit, wear something, down, yeah. yeah, and to hide, you know, her, because, you know, like body teenagers, right, I mean. Yeah, yeah. And despite the fact that she tried to explain that she does not even wear a headscarf. She, she happens to be Muslim though, but she's like, I don't wear a headscarf. That's the way I dress. She was kicked out. Another case that was brought up was this female student saying she's Muslim, but she was wearing jeans and like a top and a sort of kimono, but not Japanese style kimono, but like, you know, a long 
open, I don't even a cape or whatever, but it, it's actually something that even non-Muslim, like you, you see that at Coachella, really. <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. And she, yeah. And she was kicked out of school. Yeah. And they're suing the school for discrimination, obviously. My point being, we open a Pandora box that now literally anything can be deemed religious if we are doing that. And my question is, where is the, we have crossed the red line a long time ago. You know, if the, if the government did like a case by case situation that depending on the case, this is proselytizing or not, this would have passed. But such a blanket general ban, it's so weak. But at the same time, like, so the ban has been challenged be, before the Council of State, our highest administrative Supreme Court, that should release its decision like, soon like very soon it's 50 50 because traditionally the jurisprudence is pretty liberal but we have had cases where the council of state agreed with uh, the bans different bans that was the case for the ban of the hijab and uh, in a football competition despite like ruling against the the public advocate so it it's we cross a line but we keep digging and where do we stop yeah where do we stop? I want to build on on the points that you that you mentioned about kind of about profiling and also how religious garment can also be perceived differently. And I'm going to ask a question to Erin. Erin, I know you also wear kind of a religious garb, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would love you to kind of if you if you're comfortable, kind of just talk a little bit about that. And also, my question is, as a as a non-Muslim person of, of faith, when you look at France's sort of obsession with what Muslim women wear, and you yourself, you have committed to some kind of religious garment. How does that make you feel? What, how do you feel about that? So this is such a, it's such an interesting question. So I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which most of our listeners, I think, would probably recognize as the Mormons. And as part of my, my commitment to my faith, I wear religious underclothing. It's, you know, it's essentially kind of like a, a, a white chemise and what looks like white bike shorts. But because I wear it under my clothing, you can't necessarily clock that I'm I'm wearing it from 50 feet away. Now, that's that's not always true. I feel like there are lots of Mormons who have really keenly attuned radar for whether or not other Mormons are wearing their what we call temple garments. But it's a it's an incredibly important part of my religious identity. It is an outward expression of an inward desire to keep sacred covenants that I made. And it's, it's extremely personal, but it's so interesting to me that for the most part, if I walked into a, you know, administrative building in France, wearing my temple garments, even if, for example, I was wearing a slightly sheer top, so you could see straight through and, and essentially, you know, it looks like I'm wearing a little chemise under my shirt because I'm white and because the, the cultural, fears of, of, you know, white Christian women are not as finely tuned as, as the kind of cultural fears of Muslim women, nobody would be the wiser. Nobody would stop me. And, you know, I've, I've been reflecting on this a lot, starting even as far back as kind of our first, the first burkini bands, which, you know, came out in the, in the 2010s, about, about whether or not, like the kinds of choices that this, this puts young women it, it makes them make really difficult choices. Like, I remember thinking, would I still have continued my education if I were told, for instance, that I couldn't go to university if I were wearing my temple garments? And I think the truth is, like, I might have dropped out of school. And it's it's so frustrating to me to see this because I think, first of all, like, it's it's a piece of cloth, but it's also not, you know. And and Russia, I I. I want to bring you into this in a minute because I know you had a really kind of a very different experience as a, as a young woman, but, but it's also something that's extremely important to me as an individual. And, and, you know, Rim, I think one of the things that's been most fascinating about this conversation is, is the contrast that you've pulled between the U S and France, which are, you know, both in theory, very secular States that in the U S we work to protect people's rights to, to express their religion and that the state doesn't have its own religion versus this, this really illuminating idea that France is essentially protecting the state from, from, you know, religious encroachment. 
but I think, you know, it's, it's really, it's really tough to watch this, especially because I realize that so often it is young women who are asked to make these really difficult choices that alienate them from both of the cultures that they exist in. You know, a lot of these young women are already in kind of weird limbo areas where even if they are second or third generation French, they don't ever feel fully French. You know, we did a podcast a couple of, of months ago about how, you know, the Republic makes no difference between its children and how that's not actually true in, in how France treats its minorities. But I also think that if these young women are, are being asked to in a way, set aside their religious observance, it can also alienate them from from their communities as well. And so it's 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 a really tough thing to be someone in in a similar situation and and kind of see this happen. And also know that like if I wore a long flowy dress on the streets in Paris, nobody would bother me, right? It would I could wear the same flowy dress from Zara that has no waist, you know, that's I mean, how many, how many breezy white women have owned, you know, a paper bag? Like, honestly, it's the, what, what, like, my friends jokingly call nun core, where it's like, <laughs> that we all love, and, you know, all of our husbands or boyfriends hate. It's, it's so comfortable, I mean. Right? Especially during Kate Ways, I mean. <laughs> right? <laughs> So, okay, Russia, before we get to your experience with the hijab, I actually want to, I want, speaking of heat waves and beards, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask Reem a little bit about the burkini ban. So this, the, I think the initial burkini ban uh, came out in the early 2010s or like 2009-ish. And France's socialist prime minister at the time, Manuel Valls, said, the burkini is not a new range of swimwear, a fashion. It is the expression of a political project, a counter society based notably on the enslavement of women. I mean, that is in and of itself, like one hell of a statement about a swimsuit. But I want to, I want to ask you about this idea. Like this seems so paternalistic and I'm wondering how is it that this idea has persisted in France that like, that what a woman chooses to wear to the beach is in fact a chain around her neck and that the state should help her be liberated. Why does France not trust its women to manage their own expression of faith? So it was in 2016, actually, and I I perfectly remember that quote. And it's crazy how we made anti-Muslim hatred into an art form. Like we intellectualize it, you know. And and yes, and I'm glad you mentioned Manuel Valls because it's really across the political spectrum. It's not just the far right. It's across the political spectrum. The center left is on board with all of that, right? So a couple of things. Yeah, no, the, the Burkini, which by the way, the Burkini season is over because summer is kind of, it's not over because it's super hot here. But yeah, we, we it's ongoing since 2016. There were two uh, decisions again by the Council of State on Burkini bans on the French Riviera. By the way, the the Burkini, contrary to have, what have been stated by uh, many of our political elite as well as pundits, is not from Saudi Arabia or Egypt or whatever. Where actually it was banned because it was too revealing. It's from Australia. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's literally from Australia. Australian Lebanese entrepreneur who actually found a way for Muslim women to enjoy beach activities because you know Australia. And, and, and actually save, how do you call them? Uh, you know, the um, lifeguards were the first actually to give Burkini with, you know, so that pe- Muslim women could work as a lifeguards and just, uh, you know, be, uh, practice her face as well. But actually non-Muslim also wear it, apparently. Uh, many non-Muslim women use it, you know. For our listeners who may not know, a burkini is essentially, if you imagine sort of a very... A wetsuit with a hood. (laughs) Yeah, it's a wetsuit with a hood and maybe like a little bit of a peplum to kind of cover cover your your bottom. But it is, it's such a step up in, you know, one of the things I think is really interesting about France's persistent stress about the burkini is they're like, oh, well, it's a safety hazard. But but it's, I mean, it's just a long swimsuit. Like if, if somebody with, you know, wearing a wetsuit can be saved by a lifeguard, so can somebody with a burkini. But but also step up from what many like it really does give women more liberty to enjoy like the public beaches here in Tunis. I live just a few uh, a few hundred meters from the beach, and and it's wonderful to see that like you know on our beach we have women in bikinis, we have women in 
Disney's, we have women in their abayas and their hijabs who go out into the water and play and enjoy. And like, you know, it's, it's such a, it's such a fascinating anxiety that, that France, France feels most comfortable when it's women are more, more revealed than, than when they are concealed. Yeah. But the, the thing I think is like, we don't accept the fact that France is diverse. And the more Muslims participate to public life, you know, they go to the beach to do what? To swim, like, you know what? Everybody else. <laughs> when Muslim women work, when... I, 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 I've said that before, but I'm going to repeat it again because I think it's very revealing. You know, when a Muslim woman is a maid and there is nothing wrong with that, they're doing the job that many refuse to do and they are the most important people okay but when a muslim woman wearing a hijab for example clean like a senator's office nobody cares about the hijab mm. they're invisible but the more people are educated i mean have received an education usually like the children of this woman who have been made and made sure that her kids and uh, you know her grandkids will have the life she didn't have access education, know about French culture, because guess what? They were born and raised here. They're the only country they know. The more they express themselves, these are kids, these are students who are connected to the world, who speak other languages, who, who oh, France is their country. The more they are visible, the more France feels threatened. Mm. I've heard that a lot. We need to protect our culture. As, as, a, as an argument against the hijab, the burkini, the abaya, but what country are we talking about? Corsica, Brittany, saint pierre et New Caledonia, Guyana, Martinique. France is a diverse country. And I think that if, if France, whose culture is known across the world, fears that a burkini, like a swimsuit with a wetsuit with a hood, or like an, an abaya is a threat to its culture, it's probably that our culture is not that strong then. And unfortunately, we also use like, but look at Afghanistan or Iran, those women, are, I'm like, yes, they are asking to be free. And we are weaponizing also the fight of these brave women in Afghanistan or in Iran or Saudi Arabia to, to justify our own bigotry. And I'm like, forcing a woman to wear a headscarf or an abaya or whatever, or force them to dress or behave a certain way is wrong. Of course it's wrong. But forcing a woman to remove her clothes because we want, quote unquote, to free her on our own terms because they don't know any better. We want to free them from patriarchy, from Islam. But at the same time, oh my God, if she's visible and free, we need to bring her back home. Yeah. I mean, it is the same logic, really. I mean, the rhetoric is the same. Women should be free to do what they want with their body. It's not that hard. And yet. No, it's that's so interesting. And actually, Russia, I want to bring you in here because you had a, a really personal experience with this growing up, being made to wear the hijab at school. Do you want to talk a little bit about sort of how you, because I feel like you've had sort of the opposite experience that I had. Tell me a little bit about your experience growing up and then also how you're viewing this. Yeah, sure. And and I think Reem really summarized it a little bit, you know, just now and in, in how it's being politicized and exploited. I would actually, I'm very comfortable using that word. So uh, just to clarify, Iraq never has a, did never throughout its contemporary history, didn't ever have a law that compelled women to wear hijab or compel women to any dress code. Uh, but there is social pressure especially in my hometown in Mosul, being Iraq's, I believe, most conservative city. And when I say Mosul, I don't mean Ninawa in general. So this does not include, of course, the Christian, the historic Christian villages. This just includes the urbanite Mosul. Very, very conservative. These are families that have that descend from the Ottomans, that descend from the Seljuks. So they, they've kind of kept an Islamic identity and they're very proud of it. So a hijab being the symbol of that. And... I was, I did not want to wear one. I grew up in a family where this was not very important and we never really talked about it. But by the time I was in my senior year in high school, I was one of the few Muslim girls not wearing a hijab. And by the time I got to college, I wasn't wear, wearing one either. We were, I believe, two female students 
in the entire college of engineering that did not wear hijab. And the other female student was half British. Her mother was English and she was more, she was more liberal. And I mean, I would hear sometimes comments. There was some passive aggressive shaming from time to time, but in, at some point, especially after 2003, after the toppling of the regime and, and the U.S. invasion, when Islamic parties came to power um, in Iraq and there became more of a extreme expression of religion where people who had these radical ideas were no longer afraid of the ultra-secular, and I say this between quotation marks because that was the perception of Saddam and, and the Ba'ath Party at the time, the ruling Ba'ath Party. When this party was no longer in control, they felt empowered to express their their take on religion and on particularly on how women would dress. So, and I have written about this before in the article I also wrote about hijab last year related to the protests in Iran. I was walking back home. I live fairly close to the university and someone smacked me on the head with something. I think it was a heavy, heavy book. And I didn't see who it was, but I did see, he sounded like a young man, but I couldn't see his face. And he called me a very bad name, and he'd asked me to cover up. And at the time, lawlessness and chaos had started in the country. Um, Security forces were still very weak post-2003. I, of course, took that at heart, and the next day I wore a hijab. So this experience formed a lot of my views on, on this particular topic. And I understand very well what it means to be forced to wear something. I relate very much to the women in Iran, to the women in, Af- in Afghanistan, in other places where there are forced and where the consequence of not wearing is, can lead to death. And we saw that with Mehsa Jina Amini in Iran. She lost her life because of this and so many other women. And uh, we see this in Afghanistan too. There's, there's the consequence could be death. If not death, some kind of physical physical abuse, like what I was uh, exposed to. So for many years, this kind of formed my view. And when I would hear about women being asked, for example, in France, not to wear hijab in school because it was a religious symbol, I kind of understood that. I didn't necessarily support it, but I said I would think it's legal. And now when I see how far it's gone, and you described it, Reem, as a Pandora box, I definitely have taken a step back because it's it's extremely hurtful when my personal experience is used by the far right or the far left with racial intonations, with undertones of Islamophobia, with all of that. And my experience is used, oh, look what happened to Russia. We don't, we don't want that to happen to our women. Um, she, would, she was so happy when she took off the hijab. And I was the moment I stepped out of Mosul, leaving Iraq forever. I took it, out of, I took it off on the, in the car and I was like, I'm not wearing this again. But again, that was my personal experience. I also know so many women who, my cousin, my own cousin included, who did not wear the hijab in Mosul. But when she left to Europe, she, as she grew, as she aged, she started wearing something to cover her head, like a very modern looking hijab. So uh, my, my views on this have definitely shifted where I don't see forcing women to do anything is liberating in any sense. And it's, 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 it's so, you know, how views change and how perspectives change and seeing this experience. And, and Aaron, your experience, when you just said you as a, as a Christian woman of European background, let's say, and you said, if I had been, if you had been under the same circumstances that these young women in France are facing today, you would have probably not finished your education. And I cannot think of a context where Aaron is not New Lines Africa, North Africa editor, because you did not finish education, because you did not become the journalist you are. And, the, and, and just thinking how much France can, France can actually lose so much talent if girls decide actually to drop out and not finish their education because of this, because they feel isolated. I felt isolated from my community for different reasons, but it's also isolation. So it's, it's a complex feeling. And I think it's also something women, all women at some point in their lives, they experience. But to see it politicized and exploited by bad faith actors is, is very hurtful, to say the least. Yeah. Oh, gosh, Rasha, thank you for sharing that. I think that brings me to my, my last question for you, Rim, which is, 
if we're asking young women to choose between religious expression and education, you know, it's clear that some are going to choose the former. Last week, the education ministry said 67 girls were sent home in one day after refusing to remove their abayas. So, you know, of course, I think it's really easy for us to understand what these girls lose by not being in school. You know, if the, the benefits of education are widely documented. But what does France lose by not having these students in the classroom and, and by forcing such a difficult choice on such young minds? France is losing its own children, I would say, because these girls, yeah, they will come back to school dressed differently or they will go to private schools. Is it what we want, like girl to go to religious schools instead of going to the school of the Republic where everybody is, should be treated equally? That's the question we should ask ourselves. And another thing is that the new generation don't have it anymore. And there was an article in the New York Times, actually, that talked about it. But many are just leaving the country when, you know, they have to go to university or work. They, they are like, we love our country, but this is not sustainable. And another point is that all extremes are using this situation for their own agenda, whether it's the far right, but also religious extremists. So in the end, even for France's reputation, security, and like dignity, like it, we, we don't win anything out of it. And the first victim are literally right now kids, teenagers, like in the biggest, most important and crucial moment of their lives. That's, I mean, can you imagine being so young and facing that? Or even as a Muslim, switching, like switching on television and all we talk about is you and your faith and your religion. I mean, like there was a, an interview, a horrific interview from one of those, you know, 24, French 24-7 news network, and I put news in between quotations, interrogating two girls. Like it was like FBI style interrogation, really, interrogatory. And one of the questions was, do you wear that to cover your shapes, your body shapes? And it was so violent. Can you imagine asking that to a 12-year-old? And it, which I think speaks volumes. So yeah, France is losing everything. And I don't think it's, I, I don't think it's sustainable. What kind of country do we want to be? Because right now we are shutting out, we are shooting out ourselves. Sorry, I repeat that. We are shooting ourselves on, on the foot. And nothing good would come out of it. Nothing good. Because, you know, if they go to pu private school, they will be called separatist. If they go to public school, they will be sus suspected of violating whatever Republican values. When I hear the Minister of Justice saying that he wishes for an immediate, quick, penal response, what? Now we are criminalizing like a, a, a maxi dress? Yeah. This is so ridiculous. I mean, even I, I, I can't. We have 99 problems. Potatoes are being a luxury product. National education is falling apart. Public services are being dismantled. Inflation is ruining the country. And we, we have been talking nonstop about maxi dresses. I mean, where are we? And again, extremes from all sides are going to benefit from. So I would say that democracy is at stake here. Well, on that note, I think we'll leave it for today. Uh, Lynn, Rasha, thank you so much for joining us. This has been such an enlightening conversation uh, and I hope that our listeners have taken something away. Yeah, thank you both so much. Yeah, thank you, Rim. Thank you, Erin. Thank you for having me.